Thank you so much for coming, especially since we have so much competition outside. What a great festival this is, a perfect day. My name is Henry Jung. I'm the curator, curator, um, actually sometimes a curator. I'm the creator of 360 Riot Walk, which is a self-guided uh, 360 walking tour of the 1907 anti-Asian riots, which uh, was the sort of like uh, uh, the basis for White Riot, uh, which is this book uh, that, uh, in which uh, there are two essays by the contributing art, uh, writers here. And before I continue on, I need to, and I must, and I respectfully acknowledge that we are in the unceded ancestral territory of the Musqueam, the Skohomish, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And um, it's, um, it's, um, it's constant reflection ever since I was a little tiny kid uh, about this being a new place for, for myself and, and my family. I remember the plane trip from Hong Kong and, and the kind of uh, rupture my body felt going from one space where um, I felt normal um, as a Chinese person in Hong Kong, because I didn't know about British colonialism as a three-year-old, and coming to another British colonial space and um, feeling very alien and foreign and being treated as such uh, outside of the small Chinese community that we were part of at the beginning because I didn't speak English until grade school. So um, yeah, uh, since that moment, uh, that plane trip, uh, I've, um, I've been reflecting on my relationship to, to this place that I have the honor and obviously a privilege to call my home. So um, um, I am really grateful for you to, to um, come in and um, um, listen to us and maybe participate at the end. We have uh, basically two presentations, uh, one made up of thirds um, on that side of the table. Uh, and, and for the, the book itself, um, I should uh, refer to this is this is the book. It's got the entire script for 360 Rai Walk in here. Only the English one. There's also Punjabi, Japanese, and Cantonese um, on the tour itself. It's all available on 360 Rai Walk CA. Uh, the other contributing writers include historian Patricia Roy, who is an early uh, historian, like early in historicizing the 1907 anti-Asian riots, but also the history of white supremacy in British Columbia, which is the founding um, ideology of Canada, British Columbia, and Vancouver. Uh, so she wrote the foreword, and we have uh, other writers, Andy Yan, who's an urban geographer. Some of you might know him as the director of city, uh, SFU City Program. He's often quoted in the news. And also um, a Melody Ma, who's a local Chinatown activist, uh, writing about Chinatown and gentrification, and also the history of resistance uh, within the Chinatown communities. And also, I have a really short-term memory. Uh, so Andy wrote about the, his, uh, the census and how the 1901-1911 census is, um, looking at how the construction of race is reflected in, in that, and also ref, uh, referring to how Things have changed since, and in some ways um, haven't. Uh, a piece by a labor activists, um, the Asian Canadian Labor Alliance, uh, Stephanie Fung, Anna Liu, Karina Ng, and Chris Ransarup, um, talking about racism from racism from a labor perspective. Uh, as some of you might know, labor uh, organized labor has played a very um, integral role in legislating. Um, racism within Canada. Um, um, there's been uh, a lot of work done to, to address that, but um, uh, the white riots were, um, uh, well, it was organized. The Asiatic Exclusion League uh, uh, was, was organized by the Vancouver Trades and Labor Council, which was a labor organization. And uh, Paul Engelsberg in Bellingham, he's a historian there, writing about the Bellingham riot, and that piece uh, describes seven other race riots, all within a 12-month period of Vancouver's own. So it was certainly a popular pastime for um, some folks um, around here. And it goes way back, it goes back decades, right? Um, back to the um, 1860s, you know, with the mining, the Chinese miners coming here uh, for the gold rush and so forth. And it goes all the way down to 
um, Mexico and, and, and so forth. So, so yeah, lots of stuff to learn about and to reflect on. And to, especially since like, yeah, things have changed, things have gotten a lot better, but there's also some parallels. And the specifics of the racism that is to this area, um, and common to many other areas on the West Coast, it's interesting to compare with other specific racisms that exist around the world. The demonization of certain peoples that are different than here because they have their own history. They have their own antagonisms. They have their own conflicts. They have their own power differentials. So I think it's something that is very much um, part of um, human history and it takes work to um, change that, change it for the future. The um, yeah, anyway, so, so this project um, has been um, um, very um, exciting and to work on. The book just came out in April, released in May in the United States. And um, yeah, there's copies outside at the intersection. Uh, there's an info booth, so they have a few copies there. There's another info booth at Oppenheimer Park. Uh, so if you're interested in a copy, you can buy it there. If you want us to sign it, you can do that too. Even though Trevor, are you, you up for it? I can probably do it. Yeah, <laughs> probably do it. Yeah, we signed a lot of copies at the Vancouver launch, um, which was at the Dr. Sonia Sen Classical Chinese Garden back in end of April. So um, a couple of announcements before we launch into the uh, quick uh, the, the, um, the presentations, I guess. Uh, the next event connected to this book is actually the precursor to 360 Riot Walk which was a pop-up food project that happened in 2018. Over the course of four weekends in May and June, at four different locations along the path of the original parade, demonstration, and riots of the um, Asiatic Exclusion League's um, um, organized event. The riot wasn't organized, but it wasn't a surprise. I, I made this project called Riot Food Here, and uh, it's being restaged at Massey Books, or actually Massey Arts, which is the gallery that Massey Books runs. Uh, Massey Books is a local independent bookstore owned by an, uh, with an indigenous owner, uh, Patricia Massey. And so they're hosting this. And um, as of yesterday, uh, the tickets went on sale on Eventbrite Thursday. As of yesterday, there was one ticket left, but there might be a waiting list. They might open it up. Um, it's cost recovery, so it's, it's, it's uh, yeah. So if you're interested, there's some posters there. Uh, I've only got one left of this because I did a talk earlier and they took everything else. But, uh, this is a brochure and it opens up to a big picture of this Riot Food here. It also has the menu from Riot Food here, so we're going to serve that again. Bigger portions because it's dinner time. Uh, I'll start off with uh, candied salmon with pickled spruce tips. So the indigenous perspective, asking the question, what would you have thought when you watched the angry white men attack the Asians on your land? And the other courses uh, from a Punjabi, Chinese, and Japanese perspective, asking the question, what would you have eaten just before the angry white man came and attacked you in your homes? And then the most expensive piece of the meal is, um, is a, a very traditional English um, um, dinner. Uh, uh, it's roast beef with uh, horseradish and Yorkshire pudding. All that stuff's gonna be made fresh that morning or afternoon by the chef, Chef Chris Barnholden. Um, so yeah, that'll be uh, September 7th, which is the anniversary of the riots, 116th anniversary. The event after that will be at Simon Fraser University Woodward's uh, uh, SFU, Van City, Center for Community Engagement. Um, uh, we're gonna be having a conversation with Andy Yan, who's uh, written about the censuses, and Jack Chen, who's a, ja a Japanese, um, Japanese, Chinese American historian, who's um, one of the founding members of the Museum of Chinese in America. He's written this, uh, he, he's worked on an anthology called Yellow Peril in the United States. Um, um, really interesting person. We're flying him in to give the talk. Um, he also wants to meet local people, so maybe you'll be on the list, who knows. Um, so that's September 20th. And there's Writers Fest stuff and stuff after that. So yeah, enough plugging of uh, future <laughs> events. I'd like to introduce Nicole Yakashiro, who is a doctor, doctoral candidate 
in the Department of History at University of British Columbia. Her dissertation research examines the politics of neighborly relations in settler colonial British Columbia and the meanings of Asian Canadian property possession or lack thereof on unceded occupied indigenous lands. Nicole is an active member of Powell Street Festival Society's Advocacy and Outreach Committee, which is a big deal for the social justice work that they're committed to and they are exemplary in, in their leadership in this area. And that's why she's wearing that outfit. <laughs> and is especially passionate about bridging community work with academic research, mobilizing histories in the present to support justice work. And Nicole's gonna talk about some of the research that went into um, her and Angela May's essay in White Riot. Awesome. Thanks, Henry. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you, Henry, for the introduction. And uh, I think I'm only going to talk for like five, five -ish minutes, right? Five -ish minutes. Like. Um, so, uh, Angela May. Uh, she was formerly going by the name Angela Kruger, which so many of you might know her. She's a very uh, active person in the Japanese Canadian community, and she's also one of my uh, favorite people in the world. Uh, so her and I wrote uh, an essay in White Riot, uh, which is, you know, <laughs> I feel funny sitting here because I feel like it's more or less, um, kind of, it's drawing on the work of my co-panelists, um, and it's an essay just simply titled, Why We Say Powell Street and Not Japantown. Um, and really this emerged out of uh, Angela and I both being on the Advocacy and Outreach Committee for the Powell Street Festival Society, and so as Henry alluded to, this is the committee that really talks about some of the struggles of uh, re like trying to reclaim a place uh, which is perpetually being targeted for gentrification, and, and the current residents of the downtown east side are, are always being faced with um, the threat of displacement and further marginalization. And so, um, as far as how I see my role in the Advocacy and Outreach Committee, as well as Angela, is to, to provide a voice to interrupt uh, conversations about, you know, what does it mean to come back to this and kind of come back to this space and kind of unilaterally take over? How, is there a way to do that ethically or maybe there's not? Um, and so it's always kind of that negotiation and discussion happening at Powell Street Festival. And yeah, I, I think we all hope that that is reflected in the politics of the festival, but of course uh, there's a long way to go. So uh, our essay really emerged from that because, <laughs> and I'm sure y'all will talk about that a little bit more later, but we were going through some meetings about uh, constantly, there's, there's these meetings uh, behind the scenes with the city about, and within the community about like how do we commemorate the historic Japanese Canadian neighborhood in this place. And um, I'm a historian and as a historian I approach commemoration through that lens and I think about you know how do we also tell the histories of this place. Um, and, and so we, we noticed uh, a trend of using the word Japantown even after the years, I would say decade, <laughs> uh, or more of research from uh, my co-panelists basically telling us that, you know, based on the research, the name Japantown itself is, is really uh, a tool uh, to, to use to rebrand the neighborhood and quote unquote revitalize the neighborhood and in that process harming people who are low income, uh, people who use drugs, people who have mental illness who live in the neighborhood. And so, um, <laughs> so it really emerged out of frustration that you know we have to keep repeating these things. So Angela and I had actually originally written like a very small little card and we're like, why don't we just like pass these cards around at different events and be like, can you stop saying Japan <laughs> Um, can you please just refer it to as either like the historic Powell Street neighborhood or Paungai, um, these names that actually were more commonly used by the Japanese Canadian community um, and, and such. And so we, we wanted to make a kind of a clear, more accessible uh, message to really emphasize that there are stakes in the names we use to, to talk about places. And, um, and you know, I was I mentioned in my essay that even Powell Street is an imperfect word. It's it's named after a former uh, Indian superintendent uh, in in British Columbia, and so there's there's <laughs> there's problems with saying Powell Street as well. Um, but we wanted to create 
um, a space to reflect and really make clear what's at stake for folks who maybe don't see the harm in saying things like Japantown. And so, you know, when, when you go on Google Maps and you see that it says, you know, Japantown, I, I implore you to ask yourself, uh, what, what work is that doing and uh, what's at stake when we try to rebrand this neighborhood and, and have some sort of return to perhaps uh, uh, kind of an ethnic uh, heritage tourist site. And I know Chinatown has also struggled with these questions as well. And so that's really where that came out of. And I don't know if I have anything else to say for now. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll have more to talk about. But yeah, I think that's it for now. Thanks, Nicole. So I'm going to ask Nicole one question, and then we'll move on to the other three um, panelists, uh, writers. And then I'll ask them one question, and then I'll ask <laughs> them all together more questions. Then we'll open up to the audience. OK, so that's kind of like the, the structure to expect. Um, are you OK to hold on till the end? Yeah, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll get to you. Yeah. All right. So my question to you, Nicole, yeah. and by extension, Angela. Yeah. Um, it's been a few years since you wrote this essay. Uh -huh. And uh, I've seen some departments since then in the city of Vancouver start yeah. to use Powder Guy uh -huh. um, or Powell Street uh -huh. in, in their naming of this area. Uh -huh. Not all departments, but yeah. some more than others. But I've also seen many Japanese Canadians who continue to use the word Japantown. Yeah. So what do you think are some of the factors that play in how this name, the older name, or the outsider's name, yeah, still yeah. persists within the JC community. And can you talk a little bit more about the stakes involved in creating more awareness? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, I feel silly talking before this group. <laughs> but I, I think for me, it, it's not so much like, I, I think Angela and I really want to approach it from a way as to not blame people for using that name Be because I think it is like something that people will want and and I think there's a certain amount of folks in the Japanese Canadian community especially who see um, who are trying to reckon with a, a loss uh, and that is ongoing uh, and I don't think we've quite figured out how to, how to navigate it you know we uh, we're, the redress movement happened and we're still kind of grappling with how to talk about uh, what our community lost and how to commemorate it. And so for me, I think the, the circulation of Japantown, at least within the community, is kind of a reflection of wanting to have a place that we can be together. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I, I try not to approach it from like, um, like, yeah, I give people the benefit of the doubt. Like if you use Japantown, I'm not going to be like, oh, you're an awful person who wants to displace people. It's more of recognizing that words have power. and so. Uh, you know, in the process of dispossessing Japanese Canadians who lived in the neighborhood in the 1940s, it's really a question of, is if we want to um, be a part of another dispossession or another displacement, and and how can we how can we intervene in such a way as to like prevent that from happening and ally ourselves with people who are being marginalized, who are being targeted for displacement, and so. I know for me, and I think I speak for Angela as well, that we kind of see the work we do as, as our inheritance as Japanese Canadian people, as, as it, is, it is very Japanese Canadian of us in our mind to, to kind of push against our own community and to say, you know, what's, what's at, as far as what's at stake, um, you know, every time words like Japantown and the meanings attached to it, so like the, the idea of this kind of commercial touristy neighborhood that I think a lot of people in Vancouver would love to have in downtown east side. Um, every time we invoke Japantown, what's at stake is is creating a neighborhood that will exclude the people who you know have lived here um, for a long time and, and who have very few other places to be in the city of Vancouver. So that's why I don't know if that's an actually good response, but that's a response. <laughs> well, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Harry. Yeah. All right. Now we're going to move on to um, the folks who wrote. Um, God, what is it called here? Essay. Uh, after. 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 No. <laughs> An urban rights praxis of remaining in Vancouver's downtown east side. <laughs> yeah, obviously we didn't all do our homework. <laughs> okay. And, and we're going to start with Audrey, right? And then Jeff, and then Trevor, is that right? Okay. So I'll, I'll read their bios. Hey, Trevor. Um, there, there should be a chair um, here. Oh, you got one there? Okay, good. 
So Audrey Kobayashi is a distinguished professor emerita in the Department of Geography and Planning at Queen's University in Kingston. She has published extensively in the areas of human rights and activism, anti-racism, immigration, human geography theories, and the historical geographies of Japanese Canadian communities. Audrey. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that, Nicole, and thank you, Henry, for spearheading this wonderful project. And if there's anyone here who hasn't actually seen the book physically, we can't even begin to do justice to what Henry has done to the <laughs> pictures, <laughs> uh, which evoke an amazing and disturbing history. And that's what we're going to talk about. For the past 10 years, uh, we have been involved with the Right to Remain Collaborative, uh, doing a variety of things. And I'm not going to say uh, very much more, Jeff might, um, about the issues around housing rights and health in the downtown east side. And I'm I, I'm the past on this panel, so I'm going to talk mostly about the past. <laughs> um, I, actually, uh, just a little side note, in 1977 I was a graduate student at the University of British Columbia, and I attended the very first Powell Street Festival. Did anyone else hear it? Yeah, you too. Anyone else? Oh, Lily. Yeah, yeah a, a very, very few. And that's really where uh, I remember getting together at Aki's on Powell Street, the, the restaurant, and the redress movement was being talked about, sort of thrown around, but it really took off in 1977, and of course we achieved it more or less in 1988. So I won't say any more about that, but um, I want to go back to 1907, just for a few minutes. Um, 1885, there was one Japanese immigrant working at the Hastings Sawmill. And uh, that number grew from one in 1885 to 1907, where the Japanese immigrants were the largest single ethnic group at Hastings Sawmill and in most of the sawmills all around Vancouver. Uh, along Falls Creek and Burrard Inlet and even south of that. Uh, and it's a long and complicated history that I'm not going to talk about at all. I'm just going to say a little bit about Powell Guy. Um, this is Alexander Street, of course, and uh, Japanese immigrant work gangs organized by uh, what they called a boss or a boss. Um, would uh, write contracts and work for less, of course, than the white workers at Hastings and other sawmills. Um, Hastings was the first one. And if you're not familiar already, if you go out uh, onto Alexander Street after this and look beyond the tents, you'll see two houses that are left uh, from those days. And they are built of wood that came from the Hastings Sawmill. Mm -hmm. And some of you have heard me going on and on about the wood, so I won't do that anymore. <laughs> um, and uh, they started out on Alexander Street, moved up to Powell Street, and what is very distinctive about their way of living, among other cultural practices, is the fact that they took over the little one and a half story white picket fenced houses that were rapidly being vacated by white flight, which is different from white riot, um, as Asians moved in. And they transformed those houses. And you can still see a few of them around now. They were called Nagaya, the houses that they built around these little one and a half stories, or long houses. And they built on the front, they covered up the little lawns to the street, and they built in the back into the alleys, and they had little passageways <coughs> between the houses. And these were boarding houses that held mainly uh, single men who were working in the sawmills, as well as the, the earliest uh, uh, merchants and uh, services of all kinds that were required for a community that was 
very enclosed, self-sufficient, and of course shunned by the white people in the rest of the city. And of course that's just a little bit north of where Chinese Canadians uh, had settled along um, Kiefer first and then Pender Streets. Um, and uh, had similar institutional completeness. Uh, both of them initially male societies and women started coming to the Japanese, what was, had become the Japanese Canadian community before, excuse me, they started coming to the Chinese Canadian community. So the reason I mention this is that by the 1920s and, and into the 30s, this was a fairly large community. There were four to 5,000 in this immediate era, area and about 8,000 uh, throughout Vancouver. And in the 1920s, as a result of becoming a little more affluent, they began to build purpose-built boarding houses. Now, the most uh, extravagant of these was the World Hotel, which is still there. But there were many more, all the way along Powell, some on Alexander, Cordova, and up Main Street for many blocks, as well as, and this isn't well known, along Kiefer Street, uh, which is usually thought of as a place of Chinese immigration. And these buildings are remaining, many of them are remaining, and they are today's SROs. And so what is particularly important is that today's SROs were purpose-built for single male occupancy and many of the SROs that uh, exist today are still single male as well as, uh, but much less so, single female occupancy. And those buildings, of course, are much more than a century old. So to talk about 1907, just very briefly, because briefly, I've used my time, <laughs> um, when, that, when those uh, angry white men came along Pender and down, and, and Henry's mapped it so you can see it in the book, and along Powell Street, there are all sorts of apocryphal stories about how they came out with samurai swords, and that's all nonsense. Um, in, in fact, uh, they were pretty drunk and they didn't do quite as much damage here because a lot of them passed out. Um, but they broke a lot of um, windows. Uh, they did a lot of damage. And the following year, there was a royal commission that uh, found that the, the hooligans were uh, in the wrong, they shouldn't have been doing this, but the problem was too many Asian faces on Vancouver streets. And so uh, the government at the time under Laurier undertook to try to reduce the number of Asians on Vancouver streets. And that's another story that is ongoing into the 1920s. And then of course by 1940, uh, when these streets around where, we're, where we are now, and in this building, the Japanese language school uh, were fully occupied and very vibrant, uh, and Japanese Canadians were uprooted, dispossessed, and incarcerated and interned, uh, never to return in any numbers. And that story, I assume, is well known to most of the people in this room. And it's one of the reasons that we have the Powell Street Festival today as a kind of a kind of homecoming, but it is so much more than that. And there I'll stop. <laughs> Thanks, Audrey. Um, and just um, so we're mindful of time, we'll just try to be around the four to five minute mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like we discussed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that was great. That was great, Audrey. Uh, so Jeff Masuda is a Sansei Japanese Canadian settler scholar, presently located on the. Uh oh, I should have done my research. Well, you Vix in Lekwungen territory, but I'm actually Lekwungen. in Comox territory. Comox. In, uh, okay. <laughs> God, we need more education on how, how, how to pronounce these other letters that I don't know. <laughs> like, 
I mean, like, we keep on putting these place names up in Skomish and Hunkamnenum, mm -hmm. and there's no other information on how to read it out loud. So it's kind of lip service mm -hmm. that we can't even lip. Yeah. So we really need to work on that part of, if we're going to not be able to say the name, it's not a name, right? We've got to be able to, it's got to be functional. Anyways. <laughs> okay, so he's at UVic. <laughs> and he's a founding member of the Right to Remain Research Collective, which all three of you are, working to support the grassroots tenant movement in Vancouver's downtown east side. Jeff is a professor of public health and social policy and a human geographer by training. Jeff. All right, I got four minutes, so I uh, got a lot of thoughts up here that I'm just going to put a few out there and maybe the rest will come out as the dialogue progresses. As a, this is a bit of a weird feeling for me. I've been teaching online through the pandemic and since. And I kind of feel like I'm in one of those dreams, right, where I'm teaching a seminar. And I know that no one's actually done the readings. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay, right? It's okay. We'll just make it up as we go along. <laughs> But you're still anyway, going to give a test. It's an honor to, to be here today. It's an honor to having heard, having heard from Nicole. I have to say, you know, it's one of the best. Uh, a really good feeling to know that the work that we do is having an impact on people. Talking about the generations of of work and commitments to this community that this panel represents one small part of. It's really it's really great to see that uh, in the year 2023, all of these years of uh, work are having an impact. I also really appreciate sitting beside my good friend and mentor, Audrey Kobayashi. Her, I cannot compare to Audrey's historical knowledge, <laughs> but I appreciate it so much because every time she speaks, it takes me on a trip down memory lane of memories that I never got to inherit. When she speaks about 1907, I now know that's the year that my grandfather, my grandfather's father, first arrived mm -hmm. that year of the riots to work in the Hastings Sawmills, followed by his son years later, and then his, his daughter-in-law, my grandmother, uh, wrote 1922. And so these years of history and community building is the family story that I never got to inherit. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it's always so, uh, I don't know, it's just so powerful for me uh, to, be, to be here, to be mentored by the, the past and the future. Uh, and to continue to do this work. I want to also spend a couple, at least a minute of my short amount of time acknowledging the, the mentorship of the festival itself. This, I have been passing through this festival for now uh, over 10 years. Um, most years I'm here, sitting in a little tent on the corner of Oppenheimer by the totem. We're there this year too, if anyone wants to check us out. Um, I won't say more about that, but uh, the community is my mentor. And in fact, many of the mentors, including those with me here, but on this side of this table, are here today. And I owe so much to this community and to the people whose labor have produced the work that, no, that now goes into our little corner of this book. Uh, that in the early days of this um, Right to Remain Collective uh, are owed to the festival itself, uh, a, a, a partner for our work for so many years. Last time we spoke together, I was trying to name partners and I forgot uh, Vancouver Moving Theatre. And here we have Terry and, and Savannah, uh, partners and friends, dear friends who have helped to contribute. And, uh, you know, goes from Right to Remain past, Andy Mori and, and Ali Lohan. The, all of the ideas that we, have, that we have tried to nurture and shepherd through this chapter come through the labor that, that uh, that the creative folks that have contributed to um, this work um, have, have undertaken uh, for so many years. And so back in 2014 and 2015, uh, Trevor here, Ali, Andy, uh, Herb Barley, who's now working with me again, he's down at the park uh, manning the tent, um, really did take this idea. Like, what does it mean to remain? And the, the longer version of this paper was, had the words after dispossession. And I think that's it. I wanted to invoke that. Because the question was, what happens after dispossession? After indigenous dispossession? After the dispossession of Japanese Canadians? After the dispossession of people who are living on the street and are subject to a street sweep? 
as happened a few months ago on Hastings. What happens after dispossession? And the short answer to that, which is my plug to read the chapter, <laughs> is it's a false premise because there is no after dispossession. Mm -hmm. Let's take the example of the Japanese Canadians. We're talking about 1942 to 1949, a brief absence of an otherwise 147 year history of remaining mm -hmm. in this place from 1977 to the so-called return in 1977 of the first uh, Powell Street Festival. But of course, many know, and our research has revealed a little bit of detail, Japanese Canadians came back in 49, and, and they were here in the 50s and the 60s, and building communities slowly but surely, and finally had the capacity by 1977 to generate an entire new generation of activism mm. for other people's right to remain in this community. For that Japanese Canadians, that led to the redress. But the work to stop this long, hundreds plus year history of white supremacist rule in this neighborhood, which remains and is really responsible for the remains of the state of housing in this neighborhood. Uh, that fight goes on. And, uh, you know, and uh, this, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to contribute to this book. I had more stuff I wanted to talk about, but I'm not going to talk about that now. But thank you all for coming today and hearing. Uh, from us and from Trevor who will speak next and from hope that we can chat a little bit more. Thanks Jeff. So this here is Trevor Weidman and he's a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Criminology and Socio-Legal Studies at the University of Toronto. Previously a research assistant with the Center for Environmental Health Equity, his current work seeks to understand how urban planning mediates the politics of private property and how unconventional conceptions of land use might arise to reallocate power in the city. Trevor. Hey everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm Trevor. Uh, honored to be sitting on this panel uh, with uh, my master supervisors and uh, uh, with Nicole and Nicole and Angela's piece really picks up on our work in such a good way and I'm, I'm really honored to have it in this book next to our piece too. Um, yeah, it's so... Uh, Powell Street Festival is an important space for me and I think my few minutes I'll just reflect on on uh, some of the work that happened uh, during the 2014 Powell Street Festival, which was a really important time for both our project and for the, uh, I think for the festival as well. Uh, so we, uh, we were running arts workshops in the neighborhood that year. Um, myself, uh, Andy Mori, Ali Lohan, who are here, Herb Varley, uh, Karen Ward as well. Um, and we had been doing these workshops at different places in the neighborhood. Um, and I remember the, when we were doing a, a workshop at, at Van Du, uh, making dioramas. And we heard the announcement that the Powell Street Festival was going to not displace the tent city that had been set up in Oppenheimer Park that summer. But they had decided that they were going to move the festival to the streets surrounding it, uh, surrounding the park. and. Um, we found it like a very moving day because it was, uh, and, and everybody there was moved because it was this sort of incredible act of solidarity between the festival and uh, the community. Uh, and so we set up, we decided, and I believe it was Ali's idea, but correct me if I'm wrong, Ali, if, if the, we would, we're, we're gonna have this booth at Powell Street Festival where we had these postcards and we had people writing, people from the community writing postcards to the Japanese Canadian community and people that were attending the festival writing postcards to the people in the tent city. And so as people were engaging with the booth, they were reading the messages that were being, uh, messages of solidarity that were being sent back and forth. And it was an incredible like time. Those postcards still exist somewhere, possibly at the Nikkei Museum. Uh, but a lot of that work really informed you know, the work that you will read in, in this book um, and the longer chat or the longer article that, that is, that is, uh, that came out of that, the, the whole project of Right to Remain. 
Um, I'm not going to go too far into that, but I just wanted to say that, like, I wanted to just reflect on that that moment because I think it was, for me, it was a huge moment in shaping the writing in this piece, but then also just a huge moment for me personally as a, a participa participatory community-based researcher um, uh, and the work that I continue to do today and that we all continue to do, to do today. So that's probably more than four minutes, but yeah. <laughs> Thanks. That was great. I have to say, I was really impressed by how all of you, or perhaps none of you, describe what right to remain is. <laughs> and I was wondering if uh, some of you could, or one of you could start and see if anyone else wants to fill in the gaps. Let me tell you what the right to remain is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. there, were four, there were four claims. One of them is material remaining, existential remaining, cultural remaining, and political remaining. And those, all, those claims to remaining in the community all come out of these you know, years of, of research, interviews with folks in the neighborhood, um, you know, the, the insights that came out of the arts workshops, and I mean, I'll let you all continue on that, but I mean, the, the project was not originally called the right to remain. That, the project itself, became the right to remain through this work. And the, it was originally called Revitalizing Japantown, question mark. And, it, and Audrey really, really hated that title, but, see, but it, which is why it probably became the right to remain. Uh, but yeah, if you all want to expand on that, that'd be great. <laughs> well, it's been going since 2010. Uh, and, and, and it's had, and it has taken off and grown and, and I hope, uh, become something important for many of the people who do remain in the downtown east side. Uh, Trevor did some remarkable work for his master's thesis. Uh, elevator <laughs> I was working on plan, uh, the local area planning process in the downtown east side, and while I was doing that, so if you look at the local area plan for the downtown east side, there's some really interesting plans for a Japantown. And that it was about interrogating this idea of where's this idea of Japantown coming from in that moment, and where, you know, sort, sort of like historicizing the, the name Japantown. Uh, to basically, it was about showing that, you know, it has no legs, but that it is actually a gentrifying nomenclature that, uh, that was being used by the city at that time. And uh, I've heard from planners since that there is a bit of a moratorium in the planning department on the word of Japantown, so keep it up. <laughs> Just, uh, <laughs> yeah, but anyway, that's, I don't, I don't have an, a full elevator pitch, but it was looking at the naming in the neighborhood and, and basically making a claim for the downtown east side as a, as a, as a term of remaining. I think maybe I'll just add one or two things. It's been a challenging nomenclature, I must say, over the years. Anytime you try to have the conversation about what do you mean by the right to remain with anybody from outside the neighborhood, you end up down this kind of real kind of cone-headed intellectual wall. What do you mean by human rights and rights, this, that, and the other thing? And, and we always have to fight back against this notion that it's about more than human rights, this kind of individualized notion of rights. Um, and it's really an articulation of a, of co of a collective sense of rights. Uh, that's it, whenever we have this conversation inside of the community, and we've had many conversations over the years and focusing on SRO, working with SRO tenants for their right to remain, it comes off the tongue very easily. It, the understanding is immediate. <coughs> And it's because, in part, many of us live very individualized, atomized, nuclear familyized kind of lifestyles. And it's hard to imagine life in a collective sense. That's not so hard when you live in a, in a collective kind of way of life as many people do in this community. An analogy that I would use is swimming in a river, which I do a lot now that I live on the island in, in Courtney. For, you know, the right to remain these four dimensions aren't 
it's not rocket science. It's what are the things that we need in order to live a full life? We need material infrastructure, homes and things and resources. We need connectedness to our culture. We need a sense of who we are and where we come from. And we need to have a sense that we have some degree of political power, or political agency in our lives. Those are the four dimensions translated into. For many of us, realizing those four dimensions of life is like swimming with the current. And you know, you can just imagine that feeling. Now turn around and swim upstream and try to swim against the current. Realizing your right to remain when you live in housing precarity or completely unhoused, constantly ag against the political stripping of any sense of agency, constantly erasing any sense of history, is like swimming against the current. And yet, people find a way to do it. And they have been doing that for generations here, 147 years of Japanese Canadian passing through this neighborhood and, and thousands and thousands of years of indigenous people living in this neighborhood. Um, and so that, you know, it, it has lots of resonance and it has had resonance over a decade of working with this idea with, with residents of this community. Just a, a quick comment, you know, I've had quite a number of people say to me, shockingly, well, why would I not want to live in the downtown east side? It's Canada's tourist postal code and this kind of stuff. And I bite my tongue and just, you know, calm down <laughs> and, and say, you know, you don't understand that this is home to about 4,000 people now. And they have a right to have that home and to be able to live there with their rights recognized uh, in better conditions than many currently live. Uh, and that's part of what the right to remain is all about, that material, but also the social and the cultural and the political right to be part of a community. And that's what Japanese Canadians felt in the 1940s. Uh, and people said, well, why would Japanese Canadians want to live down there anyway? That was what was said uh, in the middle of the century, and something else gets said now. Uh, but it's, uh, it's all also swimming upstream against that colonial, racist, <coughs> narrow-minded public. Thank you. So I have one question for the group, then we'll open up to the audience in case people have comments or questions. All of you are situated within academia and employ scholarly methodologies to conduct your community-based research and strategize methods of engagement. Can you speak about the challenges that you face in communicating with or trying to involve those in the community who have not had the same access to education and resources that you've had and the cultural and class differences that they as well as you have faced and how you've navigated them? It's kind of a big question, but maybe an example, maybe something comes to mind. Yeah, I can start with this one. What comes to mind is the last time I was in this room. Uh, about four months ago, we held a uh, third ever uh, SRO tenant convention. And so uh, the Right to Remain Collective was one of, I mean, we just sort of like, the, we were the logistics team to bring this together. But it was a convention that, had be, that we actually uh, helped to bring into existence years ago when we were just concluding the Right to Remain Community Fair and we did a little art workshop down in the Japanese Hall. And so about 10 years later, we had a follow-up convention. And when I say we, I mean this room was filled with SRO tenants who work with us and who are us. Uh, and in this corner was a banner that was being painted uh, to express the people's sense of remaining in the neighborhood. And that banner was a sister of the original banner that we created in the first Right to Remain project 10 years earlier. And so uh, it's actually very unusual for me to profess these kinds of ideas that come out of our research 
in panels like this where it's just about fellow academics speaking at audiences. And for the most part, I spend my time on in front of tables with people in my team that are very much not of academic backgrounds uh, because it's it's their knowledge. This what comes to what comes out in chapters like this is not I do not have intellectual property over this knowledge. It's not my knowledge to communicate. I'm simply the purveyor of the knowledge of the community. And so oftentimes it's best when we create formats like painting uh, or again, look, that banner actually is, if you want to contribute to it, uh, again, my plug for my tent outside is go ahead and go down there. There's rock painting for kids and, and there's Bannock uh, and there's banner painting for anybody who wants to help to participate in this work. Um, and so, yeah, I actually struggle the most when I'm trying to translate uh, what is local knowledge into words that are intelligible to my fellow academics. That's the hard part. Because when you do that, when you write, you know, this chapter is great because you forced us to take what was a pointy-headed academic article and translate it back into something <laughs> that was more understandable. Um, and so, yeah, and so that, yeah, that's maybe my meandering response to that question is, is um, depends on who's speaking. <laughs> yeah. I can reflect a little bit. Uh, I, the first panel I remember ever doing about this sort of topic was at the Nikkei National Museum after our um, first revitalizing Japan town exhibit opening. And I remember making this very like off the cuff, but also feeling like quite bold. Like I didn't like want to be a community-based researcher. That was what I had said. Because like when I first started, uh, I was this fresh-faced kid from Winnipeg that was like, uh, Jeff had asked me to come onto this project in the downtown east side. I'm like, what do I have to give to anything here? Like this was my like, and, and I was uh, I remember being afraid. Like, will I be welcomed into this community and 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 things like that. And I realized that like community-based research has become completely part of my life. Like it, it, and at that time it had as well. But I just remember me feeling that fear like of coming to the downtown east side just because I didn't think that it was like my place to be here. Um, and being so welcomed by everybody and, and, and how honored I continue to feel to be welcomed by the community. But anyways, working with the community was a process of improvisation and it continues to be. I think that in un like under like meeting people where they are at and and translating <laughs> translating words in a good way, writing academic pieces, the things that we're supposed to do as academics. Um, yeah, it's an improvisation. But uh, I uh, it's it's one that I love, and I hope that um, I I really like. Jeff has been a great mentor in that in that way. So I will say that if it wasn't for this guy, I wouldn't be here. So yeah. <laughs> Just a, a little observation. Um, so more than forty years ago, uh, I was I, I was a, a hippie. <laughs> still so are, purple, still are. <laughs> who, who, for whom activism was life. And then I got a job at that venerable institution, McGill, in Montreal, as an assistant professor looking for tenure. And they said, what's all this stuff? And they said, you know, we may not give you tenure because you're doing stuff that professors don't do. Well, I got past that. And then almost 40 years later, hook up with this guy, and we get funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada to do participatory activist research. So things did change somewhat over the years. Now, they may not have understood exactly what we were going to do, and they might not have appreciated me trundling down the street with yellow cards for Jean Swanson uh, as part of research, but on the other hand, things have changed. 
And I think it's by doing the, this kind of work, not just us, but all of the people who are doing it, that uh, things begin to change and academics can uh, be part of communities, can work with communities, can, and we're not outside, we're not, we're not academics from Mars, we're part of, part of the community. Thanks. I was going to add to it. I was just thinking about that, like this, this division that we've created, especially in the academy, between like community work and then academic work is, is I mean, has always kind of been false, right? But, but I think it's especially disintegrating. And I think my biggest struggle has has been being um, witnessed as someone who is both a scholar and of the community. And and I was thinking about how you folks do so much work with tenants and. I see my community engagement primarily with Japanese Canadians. Um, and so when we think about, as you say, these class differences, I, I feel empowered <laughs> to actually call out, uh, I, I feel a little bit more on a level playing field with, with most Japanese Canadians. I mean, um, I, this is a huge generalization, uh, but a great deal of them are now you know, middle, upper class folks uh, who are in, in relatively comfortable positions. And so I'm, for me, in, in order for there to be like a uh, there's still quite a small group of us who, who are always talking about this shit, <laughs> who are always like troubling things. And for me, I see it as we need, like we need more Japanese Canadians to see that advocating for low-income people, for people who don't have, uh, don't have as much often as so many of us, is is part of our responsibility. And it's it's alarming that. Um, I mean, I'm looking in the room, and, and I don't think the majority of people are Japanese Canadian in this room. And I think that's reflective of some of my own hang-ups and, and struggles with my own community of wanting to... Um, uh, I, of course there are, I see Lily. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, I, I, um, but, but I think part of it is for me, how can I actually uh, communicate to Japanese Canadians that this is something we should care about? Um, I think Angela feels the same way, and um, yeah, yeah, I have so much more to say, but I'll stop there for now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to open it up to the audience uh, for questions or comments. Would you like to start? Uh, well, We're going back in time to your initial um, <laughs> desire to say something. Oh, sure. oh. Okay, I just, um, two questions I wanted. One is, is just the Pa'aru, I'd like to know more about the story behind that name, that word. Pa'aru? Yeah. yeah. And, that, and the other part is I'm just really interested for each of you, what are the kind of two biggest learnings you've had around what's happening in our community? Just in case people in the back can hear. So the question is where does the word Pa'aru come from, I suppose? Is that, is that the question? And then what are some of your biggest learnings? About what is taking place in this downtown East Side Historic District. OK, did you get that part? Yes. OK. Can I address that first part? Uh, Paweru is how is the Japanese pronunciation of Powell. And there was Paweru Gai, with Gai means street. So Paweru Gai is Powell Street, but it refers to the whole neighborhood. And there was Oppenheimer Park, nobody called it that. It was Powell Ground, um, where the famous Asahi baseball team played. You can put your hat on. Yeah. And, and, but it, it had much deeper meaning than the name of a street. It was the name of a community. And people all around the province would say, oh, I've got to go back to Powell guy or power whatever um, because and what is implied but not said is I need a job so that's this is where we come to go to one of the employment agencies one of the bosses uh, this is where we come to find a, a, a doctor who will treat us this is where we come for all sorts of things um. Is that okay? Yeah. Second part. It's oh, the second, the second part. part. The second part's Love big. It. It's really big. The second part is big. It's really big. <laughs> Over to you. Over okay. to this half. This yeah. Half. Okay. One sentence. Maybe we can take a few more questions, and then if we need to talk about our yeah. general learnings, that would yeah, be fine. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, like here? So, well, I mean, like, I, were you going to like, so, okay. sorry, that question to answer. We'll, we'll save it, okay. maybe, yeah. Um, so, uh, just a quick comment about um, Pado Guy Japan Town. Let me just say, I've never heard anyone refer to Hogan's Alley as Africa Town. Mm -hmm. So, good one. Yeah. Just find that out there. <laughs> But also, uh, I, I, I want to say how much I appreciate you calling it White Riot because my history books from up tonight said Asian Riot, and no, 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 no. White people made the riot. This is what you did to us. Yeah. And I've had like so many people who are around me who are white, who I go to these functions to. It's like, oh, I didn't know about this. And like, they're very old. Let me put it that way. And I like, you know, whether it's. But there's lots of young people who grew up here who don't know either, because it's not, they're not introduced to it. Yeah, and, but it's like when they are introducing the information, and like when we even had residential schools, like the horrors of exposed, crickets. Yeah. And now you're seeing like education in the United States, and here even like change from the tone and tenor of slavery, and a lot of people, white supremacists in the United States, are trying to change how it's like it's being taught. Yeah. So I guess for you as academics, I'm very curious, like, why don't you think white people believe their own history? Mm. Mm. I mean, I can definitely see. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Akira. Um, those are great questions. I mean, I think, I think there is, I mean, so I, maybe I'll go back and, and put this in a broader context of colonialism and white supremacy because I, I don't, I think to admit the violence that has happened and, and the fact that we are on uh, essentially stolen territory, I, I think creates a huge dissonance for people that I think most folks are, have a hard time confronting, you know, like I, I, I think there's, I mean, <laughs> psychologically diagnosing people. Um, I think there's something big there and, and we've been so steeped in a particular mythology as you're saying like through through how we tell history and I, I mentioned this at the beginning and how history for me is is such an important um, it, it's this is me being a history propagandist but it, it is like the narratives we tell about the past completely shape how we understand our responsibilities in the present um, and and to have to grapple with the violence of white supremacy um, and ongoing colonization is a lot of work, and I, I honestly think that in a this is so this is so wordy. I'm so sorry. In like this go 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 capitalist culture we live in, it means like and also maybe this is turning into a therapy session as well. Um, I think it requires sitting in incredible discomfort and and sadness and grief. Uh, you know, because uh, there's much to grieve as, you know, many white folks, I'm sure in the room, it's like, well, shit, <laughs> like, uh, I, I don't want to be a part of this system. And, and, and saying that and claiming that requires so much, not only like just time and labor, like I think about people like in the part of the festival who worked, like Kathy Shimizu is a great example. She works so much to fight this stuff yeah, and, <laughs> and and I think um, I think that's honestly what we all need to do and it's also a kind of going back to what Jeff said like a collectivist right standpoint also like a collective responsibility because like if we all just did a little bit if we all just sat in discomfort a little bit I, and this is me being an idealist like I really think we can move the move the needle um, but it but it is uncomfortable and it's it's hard yeah. Thanks, Akira. Okay. We we yeah we have a, a Sorry, quite a, a speakers list. So from what I have been keeping track, Terry, Trevor, and then I, your name is Carrie. Carrie. Okay. So Terry. I, I have two questions, and I'll let you decide which one you want to ask, <laughs> answer to. Um, the first one has to do around the naming of Japan Town and Chinatown. Um, I first became aware of of of, uh, folks not liking the name Japantown about 20 years ago, and 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 I've been hearing it ever since. I haven't heard the same within Chinatown, and just personally, I mean maybe it's happening, but I was wondering about the difference between the two, if, if what I'm saying is correct, 
Um, and does that discomfort within the Canadian's Japanese ancestry around the naming have to do with the displacement and the internship? Um, the, other, the other question I had was around the role of class. And I'm thinking specifically of Chinatown and, and the fight at Beatty Street mm -hmm. and how the merchants and the business association in the community um, supported the development of BD Street. So, um, you know, that the whole introduction of class in the discussion, we talk a lot about identity, but we forget about class. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, those are my two questions, and I'll let you choose which one you want to talk to. So, BD Street? Not one of not oh, 105 sorry. Kiefer. 105 yeah. Kiefer, the BD development. Okay. Which one to choose? Well, <laughs> or both? I can't. I mean, I can't speak for. I mean, the, you know, the, I'm not the expert. These are the experts on the whole Japan town and the naming and stuff like the politics of naming. But I have to say, like it's, it's yeah, it's not the comparison. There's no comparison to be made. It doesn't have to do with Japanese Canadians' different experience of white supremacy as Chinese Canadians in Chinatown, perhaps. I think the bottom line is that if there, if there, if the community <coughs> doesn't want the name, then the name should be. And it, it, people in Chinatown don't have a problem with Chinatown being called Chinatown, which, generally speaking, in my experience, there is not that problem here or anywhere else in other Chinatowns across North America. Then let it be. But this was never a word. There was no history to the word. The history, in fact, you know, there's plenty of history of nomenclature for the Japanese who lived on Powell Street, right? Jap town and whatever. Um, and so what does it matter if the community, if there's a consensus within the community that is, opposes that terminology, then we should just dispense with it. It's as simple as that, I think. Yeah. In the 1970s, there was actually a kind of hope among some Japanese Canadian business people that they could be part of creating a Japantown that would be like Chinatown. And that never happened. There was a little bit of commercial development along Powell Street. Um, but I think the fact that there is money invested in the term Chinatown and little or nothing invested in the term Japantown hmm. uh, actually does make a difference. And there's an excellent book by David Lai, who was at the University of Victoria, something Chinatowns in Canada, and he goes city by city and, and looks at the commercial politics of Chinatowns. I'll just quickly, I don't want to talk too long, I want to get to other questions, but the, the question of class, I think you're completely right. I think the, exactly what you're talking about, like the Kiefer recently is a huge example of, of these divisions within community. And so I, I also think the, the ultimate dehumanization of a people or group or race is when you can't be complex. Uh, so for me, like, I, I think allowing ourselves to have these debates and not let it undermine like our community's efforts is, is huge and, and and that's kind of what I was trying to say earlier too about like at least for me I I, um, I am interested in and not only talking about race but also these class dynamics and um, and it goes all the way back to the white riot book right of, of kind of how labor movements and working class people have have ultimately been stuck in structures which have force them to target people who were being, I'm, Audrey, I just read your old, the old paper about the racialization of Japanese sawmill workers recently. Okay. And, and just thinking also about like how so many of these communities with so little end up fighting against each other. And so how, how can we build those solidarities? So that's, I'll just say that for now, yeah. I'll just maybe one small postscript, which is no, no one on this panel or anywhere else is suggesting that the city or anybody else should create an official place name called Paurugai mm -hmm. of this neighborhood. This neighborhood is called the downtown side. Mm -hmm. right? But if Japanese Canadians prefer to you know, call it, call it Paurugai, <coughs> that's fine. But we are not, you know, this idea of imposing 
any kind of place name that is not a, one that represents the in situ community is totally inappropriate, whatever it is, each pound town or otherwise. It speaks volumes that it's the Powell Street Festival. It's not the Japanese festival, mm -hmm. and of course it's not much like Japan at all. <laughs> Trevor, you want to add? No, no, I'm good. Okay, all right. Trevor, the other Trevor. <laughs> um, yeah, my question rolls from the last couple, although it won't seem so at first. Uh, there's a great, great critic with a quote I like a lot, which is, those whom the gods would wish to destroy, they first call promising. <laughs> and the version here is, those whom cities would wish to destroy, they first give ethnic enclave names. <laughs> Okay, so an example I'd like to bring into this is what's happening with Punjabi Market at 49th yeah. uh, in Maine. Because it's kind of disturbing at a number of levels. There was a brief pulse of about 30 years where immigrants, mainly from Fiji uh, and Punjab, located in the area, had supported businesses. Overwhelmingly in the last few decades they've gone elsewhere and new, and new immigrants are going elsewhere. What happens then is City Hall planners and politicians get on bandwagons to retroactively name and commemorate. And it's much easier to put up signs that say Punjabi Market yeah. uh, and have a little street festival now and then than it is to build housing that might support new immigrants, mm -hmm. to fund cultural research and activity by people in the area and so on. So the easy way out is to put up a sign and give a name, okay? So I think that that is, really an evident process and I'm glad to hear that our guy will not move up on science or <laughs> that you can stand up and stop it. But I, I guess I'd like to vote two other examples. Uh, you know, uh, Seattle, Japanese slash Chinese area was renamed in the Cold War the International District. Mm -hmm. Why? Because of the Cold War. And Chinese were communists that are red. You couldn't have the word China on the map. So they renamed it the stupid thing, International District. Go down the coast to Los Angeles, and I think uh, LA, Japantown is a very interesting thing to talk about because it is not controversial. It is successful, maybe too much so. It's as if you took the, the cultural center in Burnaby and planted it down here and put an awful lot of money into it in restaurants. It is a, a, a vital, you know, uh, eating, shopping, whatever thing. So uh, I just throw those out as alternate modes. First of all, the, the danger of naming and the danger of the politics of symbolism over substance, and that has to do with class. Mm -hmm. Another one is, uh, what do you think of the Japantown, LA, um, uh, what's happened there, good, bad, and different? I was there a few weeks ago. Uh, they're doing wonderful things at the Japanese American National Museum. Uh, there is also a huge amount of money from Japan and it has become a, uh, a, a, a tourist magnet for tourists from Japan. Uh, and you know, lots of people are taking advantage of that. Uh, it has no vestige of the neighborhood that was the equivalent of Powell Street. Mm. It's not there. And the people in the museum are very well aware of that. Mm. So ironies about ironies. Yeah. I've been collaborating with uh, tenant organizers, community organizers in LA of late. And I think the important uh, education that I've received from them isn't so much about what's happening uh, in, uh, they call it Little Tokyo there. You know, yeah. It's the fact that in their struggle against the LAPD and against the street sweeps and all this similar gentrification, there are Japanese American, young Japanese Americans working in solidarity with those groups on Skid yes. Row and Boyle Heights, lending their efforts to, to the struggle as the same as that's happening here. So rounded by tents of unhoused people, that's what you Okay, yeah. uh, so Carrie, you get to ask your question now. Thank you for all being here. Um, your fascinating project. Uh, I'm working on a project of my own. I'm writing a book titled 
the goddess and the magic mirror, the power of you and I in the story of us. Um, it's a eco-feminist book, but it's also about social justice. And one of the things I want to draw on is, um, as I said, there are some uncomfortable things we have to we have to face. Mm -hmm. Are you are you strong enough, brave enough to face the mirror? Mm -hmm. So many things inside that never lies. The drama trauma that is ongoing throughout history, personal histories. Mm -hmm. This is what we're going through right now, and this is actually this. It's it's awful. There's a lot of grief, but it is also transformative. I have a lot of hope for this, mm -hmm. um, for a better world. But first, we have to start with the discomfort yeah. and look at ourselves. That is what the self-reflection is so important at this time. And to remember our history, mm -hmm. the unfettered truth that should never be erased. That should never be. There should never be any revisionist history. The facts stand on their own. We must always remember that. Because I'm very concerned about what's happening in the States right now. Uh, the ongoing culture war, so-called culture war, in my opinion, is, a genocide, is cultural genocide. <clears throat> it annihilates everything. It denies the reality of the lived experience of so many people that causes even more drama and trauma. I want you to put that out, that we cannot let that happen here. And I'm very glad that you're all doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more, uh, two more comments. We'll try to be really quick. Uh, 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 Blue Jays fan. <laughs> getting too emotional. Um, Pal Street Festival remains the only place that I still involve myself with community. Um, and, and that's not to say like other community organizations for Japanese Canadians aren't really rich and, and valuable for folks, but I, I think for me there is something, there's a pulse, uh, going back to what Audrey said about it being called Pal Street Festival rather than like the Japanese cultural festival, even though it's like the subtitle. <laughs> um, it, for me, it, it makes it helps to envision a future where um, it's it's not hinging on like this kind of pure ethnic group, you know, like where we can we can ally ourselves with people in the neighborhood. And uh, I think that folks like um, uh, Mayu and I think I saw Connie could have been and people who started the festival, um, they're like the Sansei generation who really came together and were like. And we're borrowing, like, and, and visiting Black Power rallies in the states, and and being inspired by these really radical ideas. Um, for me, that's it's it's like, okay, I have somewhere to ground myself uh, when I feel a little bit uh, uneasy with maybe the politics of some of the other kind of more formal organizations. So I just love I love um, the flexibility and the self reflexivity sex, reflexivity, as kind of Carrie was saying, of House Street Festival. So yeah, that's for me. I think I reflected on pretty like when I was talking about the 2014 Powell Street Festival. That's what the, the that's the main sort of my touchstone in terms of like what this festival means in terms of connecting between the downtown east side community and the Japanese Canadian community who visits who who is here but also visits this one big weekend every year as well. And uh, I see it as a as a as an event and an organization. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's my time. 
We are getting close to five. An organization that, 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 that works in solidarity with the community out here. And that's, that's the most important thing. And that's the reason why I keep coming back. Yeah. There was one more question. Yeah, it was just a comment. Um, you talked talk about the reconciliation <laughs> and history and history being erased. Um, in, 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 a, in a sort of cold note version, one time uh, the president of Germany was visiting uh, Israel and he visited the Versailles uh, State Concert uh, with the Jerusalem Symphony. The Jerusalem Symphony, unannounced on the non court piece, started playing Wagner. <coughs> and of course, there was a huge chorus of boos from some parts of the audience. <coughs> So if you want to do the spade work, if you want to do the hard work of reconciliation, be prepared to be booed at by the mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, just expect it, accept it. Yeah. But carry on. Mm -hmm. We've been there. <laughs> yeah. I have one kind of comment okay. to ask Trevor. I was just wondering what people think of housing town. So what? Oh. <laughs> 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 Purple, I'm going to be here. <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you all so much for your enthusiasm and your engagement and thanks for coming out today we'll see you around thank you, um, thank you.